you're not the driver is what we are talking about today. And um, it's a series that's looking at various aspects of our own characteristics that sometimes can take over and control our own steering wheel, which, uh, which they do sometimes. They grab hold of that boiki, and then um, they want to take over in the driver's seat. And today we want to look at envy. Envy. And uh, today we, we want to get a, let's say, an inspiration or a conviction that we want to get envy out of the driver's seat so that we can move back into the driver's seat. But to do that, we first have to recognize exactly what that is. But do you know that whoever you are, all your possessions, your character, your looks, your whole life, is wanted by other people out there? Have you ever thought about that? It doesn't matter who you are. Somebody wants what you have, and vice versa. Wherever you are, there's something out there that you want, that somebody else has got. You are drawn to everything you see outside of yourself. It's like, it's like a, a cyclical, it's a big cycle. I, I look at social media and I'm like, oh wow, look where they've gone on holiday. They look really happy and awesome out there. And then I think, oh, I'm just going to post a little bit about, you know, uh, what I've been doing today. And then other people look at that and they say, oh, wow, he's having a cool time. Look, lots of happy, smiley people on the picture. And, and it goes round and round and round. I look at their stuff and I want it. And they look at my stuff and they want it. It's like a Mobius strip. Do you know what a Mobius strip is? That's a, it's a very complicated piece of paper. Basically, you take a flat piece of paper and you give it one twist and you join it back onto itself. It's called a Mobius strip. And if you follow with your finger, you'll see it's, it carries on infinitely. And at, at one point, you'll be outside, and you keep going. At another point, you'll be inside, and you keep going. And the next loop, you'll be outside. And that's what it feels like. You know, we troll, and we're like, oh, I want that stuff. And somebody else is trolling us, and they want our stuff. And so it keeps going and keeps going. And we post stuff, and people are envious, and it's just forever. What's the crazy thing here? When your friends see your life, and you see their lives, what do you actually need to realize? It's not real life. It's a snapshot. How often have we seen a happy couple smiling, but you know in the background they're fighting like cats and dogs? It's a movie. You know, Shakespeare once said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women... Merely players. And that stage can be Facebook and others like it. It's advertising life full of overpromise and under-delivery. I found a cartoon that kind of depicts that. Dude on the left says, I've spent 20 years creating a life that others envy but I hate. Another guy says, I wish I could do that. <laughs> It's like, seriously, <laughs> it's ironic. Who of the older generation remembers this, these two characters? Yeah. Not you. No, you, you should. <laughs> so this was an advert for, for the Mac, the Apple Mac. And so these two characters, Mac was represented on the right, and the one on the left was the PC. And, and you'll see the guy on the right is in a white box. He's like more cool looking. He's got like this open neck shirt. Dude on the left is more office looking, you know, simple brown box. He's looking more busy. And what they're selling there is that Mac is saying, well, I can just get out the box and start working. You can just open up, press go, and, and I go. And, 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 and PC on the left says, no, hang on, I've still got to install a whole stack of drivers. You know, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of software I've still got to uninstall because automatically a bit of bloatware comes along and I've got to uninstall stuff. Then I have to download the latest Windows, whatever it is. And so it'll take a while, but I'll get there. So, of course, who are you naturally drawn to? You're naturally drawn to suave-looking dude on the right. That's what advertising does. Eh? It points you in a certain direction. The fact that dude on the right costs four times as much, that they didn't mention. But... Uh, but that's what advertisements do. They want you to buy their product. They want you to feel deep down in your heart envy. I am missing 
out. And today we're going to look at why is that important to understand. Because we don't want envy to drive our personal steering wheel. So what is envy? Note the green for envy. hope you can all read it. Envy is a negative feeling or desire that occurs when someone lacks the quality, skill, achievement, or possession that another person has. Another way of saying that is, when we are envious, we are focused on someone else out there, and what they've done, and what they have, and who they've raised, and how smart their grandkids are, and how cool their car is, and so on, and so on. We're looking at someone else, not looking at our own lives. And we can ask ourselves, so what's wrong with a little bit of envy? I mean, how serious is envy? I mean, that's a little four-letter word. It's like, so I feel a bit of envy in my heart. I mean, is God going to smite me dead because of that? You know, we can, we can ask ourselves. So I'm missing a couple of things in life, and maybe I'll work a little harder to get them. What is, what is wrong with a bit of drive to get the things I deserve? But I think the problem arises way, 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 way back. Uh, and often I like, to, I like to look at children and recognize a lot of what I'm feeling in what they automatically do. And, and this is one of those things. If you watch a bunch of kids for any period of time and look at their social interactions, you'll see a couple of things. You know, one kid picks up a toy, what happens? Another kid immediately wants it. He didn't want it three seconds ago, he was okay with that. But as soon as this kid picked up the toy, another kid wants it. Immediately envious. One kid is chosen to be something special, perceived to be special, immediately. Everyone else also wants to be chosen for that. Some kids are more popular than others. All the quiet kids, I want to be like that kid. One kid barely sees their parents during the day, but he sees other children, and their parents are with them all day, he wants parents like that. One kid throws a tantrum and gets a lot of attention. Another says, hmm, I like the way that worked. I can do that. Envious. It's built into us. It's a core feeling. God put it there. These are tough words to say. But God purposefully put envy in your own heart. Who thinks that's unfair? I think that's unfair. <laughs> God could have built us perfectly without any of these challenges, but I have a feeling that we would then completely miss the point of having a relationship with Him. Maybe what God did is He built all these things into us to help us realize who we actually are so that we can decide to change and become more like Him. He's given us options. He's given us choice. But we need to recognize that we have that choice, and we can choose to go this way or that way. Let me share some advertising tricks with you. So advertising companies use people's feelings of envy to create ads that make them want to buy products. I think we all understand that. They understand how envy works and use it to make ads that show a perfect life or look. When people see these ads, they imagine themselves having that particular life, perfect life, if they buy that product. It's amazing. One product and your life's perfect. Next week, hang on, I need another product to make my life perfect. And so we keep going. Especially on social media. Where it shows off their best moments, envy is everywhere. Advertisers use this feeling to make people want their products even more. They show pictures and stories that make people feel like they need to have what's being advertised. Who has not been sucked in by that? This strategy is most obvious in industries like fashion, tech, and luxury, where having something special or expensive is seen as really important. Who has not felt the urge to have the latest Samsung S20 what what. Because it can now got a multi-giga zoomy camera thingy that can 
got memory that can remember everything you've ever done, ever. There's always something more. Have you recognized that? And in your heart, you're like, hmm, this old thing. Clearly, I need an upgrade. Is it not working? Oh, no, it's working perfectly. I need an upgrade. But we're born with these feelings. We grow up with these feelings. But these feelings generate many negative emotions within us. And if we're not careful, we will die one day with this green monster still firmly clutching our hearts. It makes us compete with people who don't even know there's a competition. We either become arrogant because we become more successful than them, or we become depressed because we can't get to where they are. I'm afraid that's what happens. The question we have to convince ourselves of, is envy wrong? And I think, you know, the fact that I'm not painting a particularly rosy picture of this thing, you, you can guess that... Um, it's a bit of a rhetorical question. So, how serious is envy? You know, if you want to persuade yourself of anything, you first have to be convinced of the seriousness of whatever it is. We're now in that point. We're going to have a look at how serious is envy actually. I mean, what's a little envy? So, where do we go? Where do we check? We go to the Bible, of course, and we, because we follow Jesus... We'd like to find out what he thinks about it. Because we compare what he thinks to where we're at, and then we say, hmm, there's a bit of a gap that I need to narrow. Because I think what, come, what, what happens is, we can think it's not too bad. It's just a little bit. You know, what's a, what's a little bit of this? It doesn't hurt anybody, does it? You know, it's, it's not murder. Everyone's doing it. All of my friends talk about stuff all day, every day. So it must be okay, because I'm part of a group that seems to think it's okay. So let's create a baseline for understanding envy. So in Mark 7, verse 20, Jesus says, He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. I mean, that's not a word that I use every day, defile, but it's got, it's got a seriously negative connotation feel to it. You know, for, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, our word for the day, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evil come from inside and defile a person. Now, envy, if it was a little word in your, in your own understanding, has now joined a whole lot of friends that include theft, murder, and sexual immorality. Now suddenly we're thinking, hang on, maybe there's more to it than what I actually think. You know, he's got some friends there that, that I would definitely not agree with, but we're kind of in the same bag, we're in the same bucket. And what Jesus is saying is we're not defiled by food that we eat, but by stuff that comes out of our mouths because they're generated in our own hearts. Envy defiles us. And envy can come in without you even knowing. I mean, imagine you've got a bunch of friends, and everybody's a group of something, and, uh, and you've all got great relationships, um, and then someone new comes along. And the new person suddenly attracts more attention than what's been given to you. And are you feeling a little isolated? I had all these great relationships, now this new person is sucking this away from me. Now I'm feeling what? Envy. Feeling envy. What happens? I start treating that newcomer differently. Not their fault. But what does Jesus say? He says, this comes from your heart. And it's displayed with thoughts and words and actions. It puts you at odds with God himself. And therefore it puts you at odds with people. And when it puts you at odds with people, it damages your relationships. Once you start with envy, what envy does, envy is a great friend maker. So what envy does, he says, hey, I want to grab some buddies as I join this party. So what does he do? He collects buddies like gossip and slander and malice, and they all join that party. 
And all of a sudden, it's not just a little bit of envy, but it's half the bag of the stuff that Jesus just told us about that defiles people because it comes out of our hearts and comes out of our mouths. Envy is a great friend maker. I mean, the writer of Romans says it's something like this. He says, They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. And who they are, you need to look up, Romans 1, but is describing depraved people. Again, another word we don't often use, but a word we understand, man, this feels very negative. But he's talking about depraved people, and he's saying they are full of, and again he lumps it with envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. And you start getting a feeling that this word envy is not such a little, tiny, innocent word after all. It's actually incredibly serious to understand what effect it has on our own hearts. Envy is one of the characteristics of depraved people. Please go ahead and read Romans 1. I didn't want to read the whole thing. But what we're trying to do here is get a conviction on how serious envy actually is. Let's look at a slightly more positive twist. You know, as Christians, we, we are people of love. And now one of our favorite scriptures in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, it says, love is patient, love is kind. It has no room for envy. You've got to choose. You're either a loving person or you're an envious person. You cannot coexist. It's one or the other. That's why it's so incredibly important. As we feel envy enter our hearts, we know love automatically is making room for it. It's scary stuff. And I can keep going. The Bible helps us see that this nasty little so-and-so human characteristic needs our attention. We have to understand how seriously God actually views us. And just to put a kind of a full stop to this conversation, I want to leave you with a real zinger. You know what a zinger is? It's not something a KFC has come up with, but a zinger is like a really, like an end statement that, whew, look at this one. Well, King Solomon is going to give us a zinger. The wisest man who ever lived said this. He said, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Eh? What's a little bit of bone rot among friends? <laughs> he doesn't mince his words. And if we take them seriously and we can have a look at what this potentially could look like, that's bone rot. Eh? A little bit of envy can lead to that. It rots the skeleton, the very framework on which our whole body is built. I've got a small caveat with this picture. This is actually not a real skeleton. It's something you can pick up at Walmart. It's rubber, and they use it for Halloween. But it is scary, you've got to admit. <laughs> the thing is, bones don't rot easily. They take a long time. And I think that's what happens. Envy slowly eats away at us from the inside. It never goes away, but it doesn't have to drive us. As we recognize it in our heart, because we want something, some characteristic or thing or whatever of someone else, we can move it aside. We don't have to accept it. We can move it into the back seat with the rest of the rabbits, like anger and all the other ones we've looked at. They can stay in the back. Because we want to be in control. Envy is not a problem to solve. It's a tension to manage. So how do we overcome it? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Have you ever had that conversation with a telemarketer where he says, um, so how are you? So I said, well, I'm fine. How are you? He says, I'm well. Thank you for asking. I'm like... That's just a strange start to a conversation. <laughs> Thank you for asking. The Bible can be very clear about some stuff and very vague on some other stuff, but I think on envy, it's very clear. And it uses a great word picture to help us see it clearly. 
again, we go to King Solomon, and we're going to learn from him how to manage envy. He says in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 4, he says, And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. All toil, all achievements, I mean, that's pretty all-encompassing, spring from envy. That's scary. It means we have to look at the, our own motivation. Why are we doing stuff? Because you're not winning here. He says it's meaningless. It's like chasing wind. Who's ever caught wind? <laughs> you know, once you've got it, where is it? Nowhere. You just keep, you just keep chasing it. And then in Cape Town, there's a lot of wind to catch. But, you know, no one's ever caught it. Have you ever noticed this about yourself? You're envious of somebody having something. Think about it. I want a, whatever, bigger house, flashier car, nicer cell phone, longer hair. I could look at Khidi and say, Phew, I wish I had his beard, you know. I like the beard, envious of it. But there's something. But let's say it's something that I can do something about. Let's say I want the latest cell phone, and I can save up for it. And I'm saving, and I'm saving, and I'm saving, and I'm, I'm not eating food, and I'm not going out because I want, I want the latest cell phone. And then I know I'm seeing, oh, my balance is almost right. Next week I can get it, and the excitement builds in my heart. And on the day, I'm there with my cash or my credit card or whatever it is, and I walk into the shop, and I flash it down, and the, that box comes towards me and it oh, looks awesome and it's wonderful and I carry it home like it's, you know, like precious, semi-precious gold, gold, whatever and I open it and I'm, ah, oh, smell I always love smelling stuff. You ever smell stuff that comes from overseas? It smells different to, to local stuff. Especially when I get gifts from overseas, I'm like ah, oh, I smell Europe in here. It's not that funny. But you open the box and you, sm okay, you don't smell it, but you look at it, you might even taste it, and, uh, and you, know, you switch it on and there's new icons and it does nothing yet, you know, and you've got, to, you've got to arrange all the icons and pull them in and set them up and put your passwords in and tell them who you are and eventually, you know, hours or days later, eventually it's working properly and you're like, oh, hallelujah. And next day you're working with it and the next day you're working with it and the next day you're working with it and the next day you're working with it and a week later you're like, oh, my cell phone, whatever. It's become normal. What happened to that exciting feeling a week ago? The feeling you spent months on working on, and it culminated, and it highlighted, and you got it, and now it's ordinary. And now you, oh, look, Samsung's got a new advert on TV. It's the S20, the next one. And you're like, whew, you know, now this one, not looking so sharp and shiny anymore. Now what would happen if you kind of didn't bother about this whole exciting bit and just stepped straight into this point and you were okay. You didn't need any of that. All of that excitement is chasing after the wind. We're getting nothing in return. We didn't need it anyway because God's plan for you will continue without any envy purchases. Because it's meaningless. When he's chasing the wind complete, never. No satisfaction of ever having caught it. No peace in your forever pursuit. No contentment. It steals your joy. So must I do nothing? Well, that, that, that's an answer. Luckily, there is a scripture for that. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. So no, the answer is not do nothing. But here's the answer. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. You do what you can do. That leads to tranquility, contentment, and satisfaction. More than that is chasing after the wind. We've got to remember that each of us are uniquely made to be somebody else. No. 
We're made to be us. We're not made to be us longing for everything else. We're made to be just us. Doing the best we can do God's way. And that does not include wanting everybody else's stuff and their lives. We need to do our lives great. We need contentment. And that's what Paul said. He said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, or if my friend has got the latest Samsung phone or not. He was not born with contentment in his heart, and neither were we. We were actually born with the exact opposite. But he learned to be content, and so can we. He learned from God to see the world in a better place, in a better way, so can we. We need to learn the same lesson. We need to wrestle that control away from envy and do with us what God has given us to do. Contentment puts us squarely in the driver's seat. It removes anything that stirs up envy or jealousy or whatever it is within you. I think this is what Jesus is teaching us here. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Who doesn't want that? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He knows we can be weary and burdened, and envy is part of that formula. His yoke is easy because when envy is gone, contentment moves in, and what happens? The soul has rest. But Solomon doesn't stop there. And we're going to end with that. But he says this. He says, Again I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Here's a man with no male relatives, and if you remember when this was written, in this culture, women did not inherit anything, so he had no one to give his estate to. And yet, he kept on working tirelessly. He was relentless. Then one day he stopped and said, Why? What's wrong with me? What's driving me? What am I trying to prove? Who am I trying to prove it to? You know, as often as parents, we can ask this question, oh, I've got to, I've got to, I'm doing this for my kids. That's a terrible answer. Don't do it for your kids, for two reasons. Firstly, they have to learn to do it themselves. It doesn't help you do it for them, and then you let them loose on the world, and they don't have a cooking clue what to actually do. They have to learn to do it themselves. And secondly, your kids will be immeasurably richer with you there as opposed to at work or away. Don't do it for your kids. We think that being a Christian is all about obeying laws. Here's a law for you. God says that this type of toil deprives you of enjoyment. Stop it. Enjoy life. There's a good law for you. Eh? I like that one. But if you put all these good things together, put all these good reasons together from the Scriptures, then actually it looks like this. A heart at peace gives life to the body. Better one handful with <sighs> tranquility. I love that word. I have learned to be content. You will find rest for your souls. Don't deprive yourself of enjoyment. Hey, and all the young people are going, we like this preacher. Go and enjoy yourselves, because God said so. But leaving envy behind, obviously. Um, you know, I could be living a life being who I am, 
the life God intended for me without being stressed, trying to be somebody else. Let's get behind the wheel again. Envy, move aside. You are not the driver. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the lessons you continually uh, just put before us, Father. Help us understand envy. Help us understand what it makes us do. Uh, but we recognize, Father, if we're just who we are, you have made each of us uh, fearfully and wonderfully well, and, uh, but you've made us individually and uniquely who we are. Help us to be content with who we are, because that's how you built us. And help us recognize what envy can do to us. And yet, Father, without envy, we just look to you and we can be content and tranquil and enjoy life as you've called us to do. Uh, and Father, and recognize that that life is, would be a life of love where envy has no place. Father, we thank you for loving us as much as you do and teaching us and training us the way that you do. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.